Hello everyone, and welcome to another Dino Doc Ranking video. Last time, we saw the BBC revolutionize dinosaur portrayals in media, but a year later in 2000, they came back even stronger with The Ballad of Big Al, also known as Allosaurus, A Walking With Dinosaur Special. This was a two-part series about the life of Big Al, a very well-preserved specimen of Allosaurus gemedseni. The first part has the typical Walking With Dinosaurs format as we watch the narrated life of Big Al. Then part 2 consists of various interviews with experts who explain the reasoning behind everything we just watched. Most dinosaur shows have segments with paleontologists, but all too often they feel like an afterthought for action crazed directors looking for more excuses to showcase wild dinosaur action. That's too bad because this second part is actually really really good. But now, let's see what works and what doesn't about the Ballad of Big Al. Let's dig this up. I promised last time I would discuss the Allosaurus in detail, so here we are. The Ballad of Big Al makes some key improvements on the original model we saw previously. In the Walking With episode, Time of Titans, the depiction from the neck down was pretty spot on. The body was fleshy enough to make it look like a real animal and not just bones with a layer of skin, which happens all too often in dinosaur portrayals. The feet were good enough to make Quentin Tarantino happy, heck even the hands were in the correct position. You can see their palms face inwards towards each other, which was way ahead of its time. This wouldn't become the norm in dinosaur documentaries for another decade. Even later Walking With Dinosaur episodes neglected this fact, opting to go for the broken facing down position. Despite all its faults, good on you WWD. Unfortunately, the praises couldn't be sung when it came to the skull, which was pretty much entirely wrong. He's ugly! 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 For instance, the snout looked unsettling. It was way too short and sloped way too gently towards the eyes. Plus the tip of the snout was super round, like daily consumer of McDonald's levels of round. The end result was a creature with the body of a theropod, but the face of a Venus flytrap. For whatever odd reason, the puppet head for Big Al fixes these issues, but the CGI model doesn't. So half the time you get competence, and the other half is... ugh. Also, one of the defining features of Allosaurus are the crests on its head, which are supposed to be located in front of the eye sockets. The original documentary screwed this up by putting the crest immediately above the eyes instead. Fortunately, The Ballad of Big Al fixes this mistake in both CGI and practical models. Another complaint, which should have jumped out to you by now, is the shrink wrapping, which is strange because I already commented on how the body is packed with flesh, but the face? The face is awful in this regard. Finally, in terms of their appearances, the Ballad of Big Al pulls out a weird trope from Death of a Dynasty. Now, I didn't mention this in my Walking with Dinosaurs review because I intended to save it for here. But in the 90s and 2000s, there was this strange rumor going around that the female theropods would have been bigger than the males. The excuse given is that they had to be bigger in order to lay eggs. But coming back into reality, it is extremely uncommon for paleontologists to know which specimens were male or female, let alone determine which ones were larger on average. Even for Big Al, who's shown to be a male, or the famed Sue, scientists don't have a clue. But if we're gonna play this game, then it's probably more likely that the males were bigger, since this is the case in all living crocodilians and most birds. So I will have to dock points for the BBC pushing this myth. Now when it comes to behaviors, The Ballad of Big Al does a much better job. One aspect in particular that I like is how the documentary was way ahead of its time in the way predatory dinosaurs usually interacted. Instead of living together in packs that cooperate to bring down larger prey, it's more likely that they would have congregated in loose, unorganized gangs brought together by the presence of a potential kill. Think more Komodo Dragon and less Wolf. This is exactly what we see when the Allosaurus bring down the weak Diplodocus. I'm impressed at their portrayal, even though the pack mentality still persists to this day over 20 years later. 
Also, I appreciate the inclusion of cannibalism, because Allosaurus is one of those top candidates for possibly cannibalistic dinosaurs, with bite marks and teeth found on their bones most likely being from other Allosaurus. Parental care in dinosaurs is pretty much a given at this point, and it was even way back in 2000. Unlike most mainstream ideas about dinosaurs, this one is actually backed by plenty of fossil evidence. But I like how the creators kept the parental care to moderation. As the paleontologists explain in part 2, the teeth of these babies probably wouldn't have been able to take chunks out of meat, instead being more suited for catching small creatures like bugs, meaning that they probably fed themselves from time to time. Combined with the fast growth rate, it's likely aloe babies didn't stick around the nest for too long, unlike 30 year old humans who stay in their mom's attic eating pizza bagels with their anime body pillows. This is also a given, or it should be, but warm-blooded dinos. Thankfully, mainstream portrayals have done away with the slow, lumbering swamp monster view of them, but this documentary does a good job at showing the scientific reasoning for how we know they were agile, active animals. But although they had bodies much like birds, their brains were more crocodilian, so their behaviors are shown as such too. Do we know exactly how Allosaurus lived and behaved? No, but comparing brains to their distant relatives might give us a good clue. As for Big Al himself, I appreciate all the attention to detail that the creator Tim Haynes gave him. This documentary shows the many pathologies found on his skeleton and tries to give plausible explanations for them, like how the caudal vertebra broke from a diplodocus slap, or how the middle toe bone on the right foot was hurt and infected from a bad trip. So this isn't just Allosaurus, an average documentary, Nah, this is the ballad of the legendary Big Al. The Allosaurus who gave the original YOLO, lived fast and died young. Wait, actually, there is one major inaccuracy I overlooked. Watching other shows, you quickly learn that Allosaurus spent most of their time stomping on the necks of Ceratosaurus. Apparently, it was their favorite sport. Big Al doesn't treat Ceratos like dirt, so that's an instant quadruple F-. Most of the other animals that make an appearance here were already showcased in Time of Titans, so I'll try not to repeat myself too much. I won't go as in-depth with it. Thankfully, many problems here were solely products of the time, so like last time, I won't be too harsh. At the time the Ballad of Big Al was made, there was a prevalent theory about the Cleveland Lloyd Quarry in Utah. It was believed that this quarry was a predator trap like the La Brea Tar Pits. What we find is a vast majority of animals being identified as Allosaurus, with over 40 individuals confirmed, while all other species are usually less than 5. Because of this, it's been hypothesized that herbivores like Barosaurus, Stegosaurus, Camarasaurus came to a lake bed, got stuck in the mud, and died of exhaustion. This in turn would then lead to Allosauruses coming into the lake bed, hoping for an easy meal, but then getting trapped themselves, and the Allosaurus just keep piling on and on as the body count grows. This is one hypothesis, but more recently it's been proposed that this wasn't a predator trap, but all these Allosaurus were pushed to this one location due to a drought. With a large amount of Allosaurus present, the herbivores get scared and run off, not drinking here, and the Allosaurus were left without a food source, so they decided to cannibalize each other. And this makes sense because most of the individuals found here were younger, meaning that they got eaten. But again, this is just a hypothesis. Once again, the Stegosaurus is too dummy thick, since the hip bone was thought to be bigger than it really was. Aside from that, I don't have many other nitpicks. It looks good for the most part. The same goes with the Plotticus. The whip-like tail on it and a Patasaurus is a nice addition. It's like we got a crossover between Jurassic Park and Indiana Jones, who would have some choice words for private fossil collectors. That belongs in a museum! They're hard to see, but the feet look too elephantine and less sauropod, so that's a mistake. Also, the neck is in that outdated, strictly horizontal position like last time. One of the Lesties most likely was covered in feathers and lacked any sort of crest, but we don't need to get into that again. Instead, let's discuss the Othnelia, because I didn't cover it before. These small Allosaurus appetizers are okay, but look a little funky. For starters, just the name Othnelia is invalid. It along with Othnelosaurus and Drinker have been synonymized with Nanosaurus. 
The body itself is strange, with a big head, pronated hands, and stubby tail. Nanosaurus, along with the other small herbivore Dryosaurus, probably would have had some degree of fluff. Other small Ornithischians have been found with direct fossil evidence of feathers, so their presence was far more widely spread than previously believed. I could nitpick at Dryosaurus too, but really it has all the same problems as the Othnelia. Except it's actually valid, so good on you BBC. The Anurognathus too is no better than last time, so we can just conclude here. The Ballad of Big Al is for the most part more of the same. Only a few changes were made in the Allosaurus puppet, but the flaws carried over from Time of Titans are offset by lots of quality insight from paleontologists who give solid reasoning for the many Allosaurus behaviors they show. This potential life of the Big Al specimen is presented really well in a quality dinosaur documentary followed by a great second portion that does an amazing job at showing what paleontologists think about dinosaurs and why. Some of these ideas we may take for granted today, but this documentary did a wonderful job explaining them. Compared to lots of the crazy stuff we'll see later, here we see some of the most grounded, conservative, red-pilled speculation ever. Overall, The Ballad of Big Out doesn't necessarily improve much on walking with dinosaurs, but the ratio between good and bad has been skewed for the better. And for that, I'm giving it a respectable B. Allosaurus had never seen such poop before. The legendary creature was done justice, and no Ceratosaurus were harmed in the making of this documentary. So guys, what do you think? Was I fair to Big Al? Are there any other compliments or complaints that can be levied against it? Let me know in the comments down below. And remember, if you enjoyed this video, to please leave a like, subscribe, and check out my social media. See you then.